Hey guys, welcome back. So today we're out at the range, still recovering from the flu, but I will say I feel much better. But excuse me if my voice cuts out during this video every now and then again. But today we're out here to shoot a rifle. <clears throat> As I say that, I have to clear some phlegm. <clears throat> I'm feeling better, guys, trust me. The FNC. It's a rifle that many of you guys have asked me to talk about. You've seen me post pictures of it. I've definitely shot it in the past, but we've not dedicated a video to it. And another rifle we'll talk more about this year that I've shown in previous videos but haven't gone into great detail because it's one of those rifles that just seems so familiar to me. I assume everybody else is kind of tired of hearing about it, but it's really not true. And that would be the FNFAL. The FAL was considered the right arm of the free world when I was a kid. That's because over 90 nations adopted this weapon as their service rifle. The rifle I'm holding in my hands right now, this is the 50.63. This is a Belgian made rifle and uh, the 5063 is the paratrooper, so it has the folding stock, has the folding charging handle, and has the shortened barrel. But this was one of many different FN designs, and we'll del delve into that in another video. We'll talk more about the FAL, the L1A1s, and things like that. But the FAL wanted to, or the folks that wanted to use the FAL wanted to get out of the uh, 762 by 51 NATO a mold that they were placed in really by the United States. The United States kind of pulled a fast one on NATO and forced them into a 30 caliber cartridge when in reality, and there's a whole story there, the rest of our allies wanted to go to a smaller, truly intermediate cartridge, but the United States pulled a fast one, adopted the M14 versus this, and then also adopted the 308 and left the rest of NATO going, what just happened? Well, anyway, everybody decided to standardize on the 556 eventually, which occurred in the late 1970s. And that's where the FNC comes in. So we're going to talk about the FNC this afternoon, but first I'm going to fire off what rounds I have remaining here in this old beauty, my FNFAL 5063. Such a beautiful piece of work, guys. And then we're going to do some shooting with the FNC. So here we go. Locks open like she should. What a sweet shooting rifle. All right, let's drag out that FNC and take a look. Here it is, guys, the FNC. This rifle was adopted by a couple of different nations. Primarily Belgium adopted it, as did Sweden. Sweden calls it the AK-5, but it's the same rifle. This rifle was developed around the 5.56 millimeter cartridge, which was becoming the NATO standard. And uh, everybody was ditching the 308 or 762 by 51 and moving over to the 22 caliber rifles. And so this was FN's idea. And again, FNC stands for Fabric National Carbine. And it's really an interesting rifle because it borrows very heavily from uh, two popular designs of the era. That would be the M16 and, of course, the AK-47, both influenced the design of this rifle. It's a really well-designed gun, but it didn't really catch on in military circles. It certainly didn't gain the popularity that the FAL gained. But it is a very good rifle in its own right. And we're going to tear it down for you here in a little bit, show you what it looks like on the inside. I, I think once you see inside, you're going to understand better uh, just how close this is to the actual AK design, but in my opinion, uh, improved over the AK. The rifle has a standard 22 millimeter NATO flare, or flare, I'm sorry, grenade launcher muzzle device out here. And then it comes back, it has the, the cuts here for a bipod if you would like. It has grenade sights, so when you flip this up, you can use a grenade launching cartridge, and this will shut the gas off to the rifle, so you can launch rifle grenades. Back here we have just a standard metal handguard that has a polymer wrap around it to keep your hands nice and cool. Up front, those stamped sheet metal, so if you grab it forward while you're shooting it a lot, it will burn you. So you want to keep your hands right here. Coming back, we have a gas selector. That's what I call high cycle, or it's designed to operate the gun when it's dirty. This would be standard cycle, which vents a little extra gas off up front. We'll show you that when we disassemble the gun. And then we have a standard reciprocating charging handle. You'll also notice this port cover. Guns, more modern designs, are still using this port cover. 
Think of the Galil Ace, for example. They're using the exact same type of port cover to keep the action closed, but the charging handle acts directly upon the bolt carrier, and that's how this, the weapon cycles. It has a magazine release right here, exactly where you would expect it to find uh, on the M16 AR-15, but it's not fenced like the M16, but it uses standard AR-15 or NATO magazines. Back here we have a very conventional FAL looking pistol grip, has that sheen to it that true Belgian made products have. And then of course we have our rear butt stock. Now this is the fixed stocked model. They also made a paratrooper version that had a side folding stock. On top we have peep sights, just standard aperture sights. We have an adjustable for windage rear sight, and then we have just a standard protected post front sight up here, which is adjustable for elevation. So that's pretty much the quick rundown on the FNC. Let's see how it works. Now, unlike the FAL, which you can tune the gas system to the cartridge, this just has two settings, high cycle and low cycle. Make sure you have it to the, the far left. That will be low cycle. That vents a little extra propellant gases out front. That makes the gun run a little smoother. I'm using some standard 193 ball. This is Freedom Munition stuff. And uh, we'd like to thank the guys over at Freedom for making this ammunition available to us. We do have a discount code down below. And that code, which is MAC, is good for 6% off anything in the Freedom Munition store. They sell all sorts of stuff, not just the Freedom Ammo, but this is their newly manufactured M193 ball. So I've put the magazine into the gun, charged the weapon by pulling the bolt to the rear and releasing it. And then we have kind of an FAL style selector lever. Now it would have a third position over here for the military version, but it doesn't have full auto capability. But you'll notice even with my large hands, I really have to reach up there with that thumb to get that safety over to fire. All right, so let's go ahead and see how this bad boy shoots with this 193 ball. All right, so what you'll notice right there is that the gun does not lock open on the last shot fired like the FAL. That lack of a bolt hold open is a common European feature. They do it on purpose. Uh, and the only reason I can come up with, I've never had one of the European engineers explain it to me, but I suspect it, it's due to the fact that when these guns lock open, a soldier is going to take cover to reload typically, and that leaves the mouth of the gun wide open for the ingress of dirt. That's one of the things that makes the Galil and the AK and other rifles more reliable is the fact that they don't lock open on last shot fired. So um, I like both. I, I can understand the philosophy behind both, but I am more used to the controls of the AR-15. So that was an FN style magazine that we fired. This is just a standard NATO contract magazine. We just have 20 rounds loaded into each of these magazines. Locks in charge the rifle. It's a very, very smooth shooting rifle. Has a very effective muzzle brake on it and just shoots really nice and flat. All right, goes click on the last shot, weapon's empty, drop the magazine out, and there you go. Very, very cool, very smooth shooting rifle. A lot of these guns were imported into the United States. They didn't sell all that well, and then we hit the 1986 machine gun ban, and these became scarce because a lot of people found these guns to be very easy to convert to machine guns, and so before the 1986 ban happened in May of 86, companies were cranking out legally registered sears for these guns to turn them into machine guns and so then everybody started buying the semi-automatic versions of these guns up off the market and converting them into nfa or machine gun items leaving those of us that like the semi-automatics kind of high and dry these things now command a premium price if you can find them used on places like gun broker they've become extremely rare and expensive firearms um, but they are out there, so if you want one, shop around, but be prepared to pay $3,500 to $4,000 for a really nice example. Taking the FNC apart is really quite simple. 
First, we want to make sure that the weapon's clear. I drop the magazine out by hitting the magazine release button, and it should just fall right out. Next, you want to check to make sure that the chamber is empty. There are no facilities for locking the bolt open, so I'm just going to go ahead and check the chamber, and the gun is, in fact, clear. Now, this is where the hybrid between the AK and the AR come together. Much like the AR, you have two pins. You have one forward and one aft. To disassemble it, you can pop the rear pin out, and it's captive pin. It won't come all the way out, and then the gun will hinge open, much like an AR-15, and it'll hinge only that far. That will allow you to take the bolt and carrier out of the weapon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab a hold of the charging handle. I'm going to pull it to about this point, and then I need to lift up on this port cover, and then I can simply pull the charging handle out. Now, there's one other thing I want to point out really quick. At the rear end here, this rear plate has a little tab that sticks up underneath this rear block. You're going to want to pull down on that a little bit to, to unseat it. Otherwise, you're going to pull back on that charging handle, and you're going to do it under spring pressure. You'll pull too hard, and you're going to launch something out the rear end. So break that free, pull it out this way, and as the charging handle comes to its rearwardmost travel, go ahead and lift, lift up on this little port cover and pull out on your charging handle, which will then free the bolt carrier group up, all right? And that'll come right out the rear of the gun. Lo and behold, look what we have there. All right, we'll look at this closer here in a minute, the bolt and carrier group. Now, you can go one step further, pop this front pin out, which I'm gonna go ahead and do, and just like the AR-15, you can remove the two halves. All right. So now we have the two halves of the rifle. I'm gonna set the bottom half over here really quick and I'll show you how to take the hand guards off as well. So the hand guards are held in place by a little spring that's right here on the front sight block. And you can see that they're rounded. And that's so you can get a thumb on there and push. So I'm gonna break that spring loose on one side just by pushing and then push it on the other side and it'll come completely off. You see how that spring's captured by the barrel now and this sling swivel? It's just sitting right there. Now your hand guards will simply pry away. Now, also, this gas shut off for the grenade sight comes down and wraps around the hand guards. It makes it a little bit easier if you put your grenade launching sight up and now the hand guards will simply just pop right off the gun. And they're two halves with aluminum heat shields on the inside. Now you can see how this gas selector works. Right now, this is your gas tube where the, the long stroke piston rides. But if you look right here, let me put my finger next to it, right in front of my index finger, you'll see a little tiny hole. That's a gas bleed off hole. Right now that hole's open to the, the environment. So right now when the gun fires, excess propellant gases are vented out that hole. If I need that extra gas, to cycle the action and not vent into the atmosphere, that's when I flip this switch. When I flip the switch, watch what happens to that gas hole. It gets covered up. Now all the propellant gases are, that are pushing the bullet down the barrel are no longer able to vent into the atmosphere as readily, and that gas is used to directly impinge upon the long stroke gas piston. So here you can see it off, and that's in regular cycle, and this is what they would call high cycle or for you know, dirty operating environments, that's high cycle. All right, so this will, on a machine gun, actually increase the rate of fire. It'll be uh, firing at a cyclic rate slower here and faster here because you're giving the gun more gas. So that's how that rather simple system works. So that's your whole upper assembly field stripped. It's all made out of stamped sheet metal. And then the lower assembly is made out of milled aluminum and then you can see your trigger group setting inside there. This is as far as you would need to take the gun down to field strip it. Let's take a look at the bolt and carrier here really quick. Now obviously when you look at this bolt and carrier, the first thing that comes to mind is AK-47. And you'd be correct, this is a modernized AK-47. Simplified even, if you ask me. So here you, to take your bolt out, you can see the cam pin right here. This is how the cam pin works, so when it's locked up, it's in battery like this. When it fires, comes back and cycles and then closes again. You just rotate this cam pin up and out, and the bolt comes out. Now your firing pin is in there, and it's captive. There's a roll pin that requires a punch 
to get the firing pin out, but you don't need to take it out to clean the weapon. So this is fully disassembled for field maintenance. To put it back together again, you just simply slide your bolt back into its carrier like that. I'm gonna put my hand guards on. I'm gonna leave the gas system shut off with the grenade launching sights. There's little dimples. If you look right here where my index finger is, there's a little dimple, and that dimple aligns with a hole in the hand guard. Just line that up, push it down, but first, I'm sorry, you have to take the bottom edge, like an AR-15, and rotate that in, and then hit that little dimple, okay? One hand guard's in place. Now I'm gonna hold it in place while I grab the other hand guard. I'm gonna put the bottom end in this little ring at the bottom, rotate it up, hit that little dimple. It'll kind of pop into place. Take my retaining spring, squeeze together on the hand guards, and push that retaining spring down. Yeah, that's the right way and it pops in place and now your hand guards are back in place on the rifle. Okay? You can, you can put your grenade launching sight back down. To put the bolt and carrier back in, all you have to do is the, sp the spring of the firing pin spring will naturally push that bolt forward for you so you don't have to worry about it being in the right position. Just simply drop it in, line the piston up with the, the gas port, and just slide the entire mechanism back together. The last thing that you have to do is line up the hole for your charging handle, slide that in, and now the gun has the upper half of its assembly put back together. Pin your uppers and lowers back together again, and you have a functioning rifle. So it's a very, very simple rifle to maintain in the field, and I can see why Sweden, for example, and even the Belgians like the gun. It's a very robust, simple design. The Military Arms channel is viewer supported. That means through Patreon, our viewers support the channel. YouTube demonetized gun channels, conservative speech channels, video game channels, knife channels, just about everybody. And it's forced us to look elsewhere to support our channels, to support our growth, and we chose to do that through Patreon. There's a link down below. Please click that link and learn more about becoming a Patreon supporter and what that means and what we give back to you guys as a thank you for directly supporting us here at the Military Arms Channel. Another great way to support us is to swing by our Forged from Freedom store, which is forgedfromfreedom.com forward slash military arms. You can pick up shirts like this one. You want to vote for a Democrat, a Republican, or the AR-15? AR-15. But guys, seriously, you can pick those shirts up over at forgefromfreedom.com forward slash military arms, or just follow the link in the description down below. Thanks for supporting us, guys. The FNC has mounting points for optics and other accessories like night vision. You may not notice it, but it's integrated into the rear sight block and also this front machined block here on the receiver. You'll see a little recess cut into here, and here on the rear, you'll see a little shelf. Now this is not a military mount. This is manufactured by Stormworks, and they still make these. I bought this probably four or five years ago for the rifle. But it locks in using a simple drum mechanism. You see this little half circle? That's how it locks into the locking groove. So I'm gonna put the toe of the mount in the front like this, and then the rear side is held in place by that little drum. Let me grab a screwdriver here really quick, and I'll try to do this while I'm holding the gun up. So you have this little drum right here, and once it drops down low enough, it's got to loosen it up a little bit more. It'll slide right over. Just, I'm going to drop it out, you watch. <laughs> it slides right over and sets down, and now you tighten this up, and it'll draw that half circle up against the mount. And now you have a 1913 rail on your FNC and also co-witnesses quite nicely. So now you can mount different optics to the gun. Here I have a Trigicon MRO on a low mount, which is a QD mount from Midwest Industries. Now I can run a red dot sight on this rifle, even though red dot sights were not readily available or used back in those days when the gun was originally serviced or put into service. The addition of that 1913 mount allows me to mount all modern optics and accessories. So that's kind of cool. Now the AK-5 is an evolutionary step up from this. This is the original FNC design, but yeah, this is pretty cool. Now I've not zeroed this, 
So it will be interesting to see. I can barely see my iron sights. Wow, they look pretty close to being on. You know what, guys? Let's just see what happens. I've never fired this red dot sight on the gun before. Uh, I have my ears and eyes here. Let's just see what happens. This should be interesting. We're about 50 yards away from our challenge target. It's our beater target that we shoot at close range. I don't recommend shooting steel as close as we're shooting. I do have ballistic protective lenses in these um, glasses. Some more of the Freedom Munitions, 55 grain, 193 ball. And let's just aim low because I can kind of see my sight picture and it looks like this red dot just might be a little bit high. Now it looks like it was low right. So as I'm facing him, if I hit the top left shoulder at the top right edge or top left edge of the shoulder, it's hitting the steel target. Oop, and we got a malfunction, guys. How about that? Now, that was with the Lancer 5 magazine. Keep in mind, guys, these magazines weren't around when this gun was designed. It was designed to run on FNC magazines and NATO standard magazines. Let's take a look at the malfunction that we got. You can see up inside there, uh, it was just a failure to feed the round and nose dived into... Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and drop the magazine out. I try not to lose that round. The round nose dived into the feed ramp. And that's probably a result of the Lancer magazine. You can see that it crushed that round when it nosedived into the feed lips. So that's the first time I've ever fired a Lancer magazine in the gun. And I love these things. They work like tops. It was last round. They work like tops in every other rifle I use. But for whatever reason, it nosedove and uh, caused that last round of malfunction. Interesting side note. I've never had a malfunction with the FNC running its own magazines, though. Since we had that malfunction with the Lancer 5 magazine, I want to see how a PMAG works in this rifle. To be honest with you, I've never used anything but NATO-style aluminum magazines, U.S. contract magazines out of the gun, or its original um, metal FNC magazines. So let's see what happens with this old PMAG. We have 20 rounds loaded. Locks in okay. I'm just going to shoot some wooden sticks out there. Let's see if she works. Alright, looks like she worked okay with the, the P-Mag. That's by no means a definitive test, but uh, yeah, seemed to work okay there. Now we have 20 rounds out of just a standard Stenag USGI military contract mag. See how she works. flawless function there with the USGI mag. I expect no problems with the steel FNC magazine, but guys, let's walk forward and find out something that I know you guys are going to ask. Does it 80s hip fire? We already know it doesn't take Glock mags. Let's go find out, but we've got to get a safe distance from the berm first. <laughs> All right, guys. Jason says I get one chance at this. And I have 30 rounds loaded into the standard FNC magazine. And he wants to see if I am able to 80s hip fire and bump fire this thing. I've never even attempted it before. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Jason knows as well as I do. That was my first time. He's over there shaking his head. I can bump fire almost anything. That was the first time I ever tried that. He's back there laughing. Hand me the camera. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. <laughs> you can't even make that stuff up. I mean, I give him the one challenge. That's, that's all he's got is one shot. And he's done it every time so far. What can I say, guys? I don't need a bump stock. 
I guess every time I do that, though, I'm one step closer to the ATF arresting me for the use of my accessory here that I was born with. I hope you guys enjoyed coming out to the range with us this afternoon and playing around with this Cold War relic. Well, can't really call it that because it still is in military service as the AK-5. But this original design was designed during the Cold War. Uh, it was something of a military flop because not as many nations adopted it as adopted the original rifle, which would be the FNFAL. But still, it was a success. It did okay on the U.S. market until it was banned from import. And uh, yeah, it had a couple of countries. I think even Indonesia picked up several thousand of them. So it's a really cool rifle from history. It's a lot of fun to shoot. It's a very, very pleasant rifle to shoot. Certainly easy to maintain. And of course, being heavily based on the AK-47, you could expect reliability out of it, except with Lancer 5 magazines. <laughs> but I can't fault it for that. The magazines hadn't been invented yet when it was. Guys, we really appreciate you following the channel. We're celebrating our 10th year now doing this, and we couldn't have done it without you guys. So thank you very much for helping us and following us for these last 10 years. Here's to another 10 years. It's been a lot of fun, and we're looking forward to the future and what it may bring. If you guys would like to support us here at the Military Arms Channel, another great way to do that is to swing by and check us out at Copper Custom. That's our online store, and you can find us there at coppercustom.com. And also don't forget to swing by and check us out at full30.com. That's full30.com. It's where you're going to find most of the top content creators in the firearm space posting videos outside of YouTube who is trying to constantly ban us. All right, guys, last few rounds, then we head home. Thanks for watching again. Talk to you soon. I like the last round hold open feature, but I can get used to it. I love this gun, guys. I really do. See you later.